Can you all stand up? I mean, I've been sitting down, and I know if you're like students in a classroom, you're probably going, hey. So as a teacher, I know that when people are in the back of the room and I'm talking, they're probably thinking of their mother or their lunch and stuff like that. And so I hope that uh, all the wonderful things we've heard already, uh, that you can add a little bit more to it. So thank you. Yeah, let's see. Uh, OK, uh, just a, a show of hands. Uh, has anyone been in a flipped classroom or used a flipped classroom? Didn't flip? Oh, OK, good. We have one person. Hey, got to start somewhere. So flip classroom, uh, I'm going to just kind of mosey around and show you how I got involved in this because uh, it really involves everything I've done up till now. So I got a, a master's degree in 1977 after five years of teaching, and I decided to, well, what, what's a better thing to do than join the Peace Corps? So I joined the Peace Corps and went to Nepal. I'm right. Uh, and I went to Nepal, and I spent uh, three years there in the Himalayan mountains teaching students to, te to learn English who really didn't want to learn English. Uh, I lived at 8,000 feet with no running water, organized running water, uh, no sanitation, any organized sanitation, no electricity, but lots of nice people. And I taught in a school that was totally built with concrete and bricks, and, and it had no windows, basically, and tin roofs. And I thought I was doing a pretty good job. I was teaching English as a second language. And when I went up to write on the board, I realized that the board was actually just paint on, on the concrete wall. And so when I started writing with chalk, it would disintegrate by the time I got to the end. So I figured I'd better not do a lot of writing on the board. And I thought I was doing OK, but there were always kids in the front, kids in the back who weren't speaking any English at all. And I was kind of worried as to you know what was I doing. But one day I came in, and this little kid, Ram, came up came up to me and he said, sir, how are you? And I was really surprised. So I said, I am fine. How are you? And he looked up and he said, I am fine. How are you? And after about a minute, we broke out laughing. And I figured, well, OK, that was fun. And then I started thinking, well, hey, I'm a good teacher. I, I've taught the, I'm going to be teacher of the year before the end. I, I was thinking, this is great. And then I started asking around, and I found out that that was not true that he had actually learned to say that from listening to shortwave broadcasts from Radio Moscow, which had an active English program. And I also found out that Radio Beijing also had a wonderful program, Radio Nepal also. And our flagship, Voice of America, well, they broadcast from Divergent Islands in special English. And that was about, about it. So I realized, wait a second. I grew up in New York City. Everybody had technology. We all had radios. And so technology was just something we had. But here, I'm sitting up in the mountains, and there are people that are learning just by using technology. And that was a, a seminal moment for me. I realized that I, I would like to do more of that. I'd like to find out how I could use technology to help lift people up. And from there, let's see. That's my house, the one in the back. Uh, in Nepal, they never invented the chimney. So uh, all the smoke was in the houses, and uh, it, it's invigorating. Uh, and the lightning, the light strikes the pot is what they say in Nepal is when you get an inspiration. And that's what happened to me up in the mountains. I got this inspiration. I want to do more with technology. I want to do more. Actually, it's just a tool. It has nothing to do with anything. It's just something you use to help people. And that's just a gratuitous picture of me and my wife. Okay. So uh, later on, we moved to Alaska. And I taught in the bush. This is Alaska here. And the area that we worked in was called the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. It's about the size of New England. It's got uh, 53 of 54 Native American villages, Yupik villages, Yupik Eskimo. And we would teach them, they would come in sometimes to our campus, and sometimes I would actually fly out to the campus. And then I started doing distance learning out there. So we used things such as 
conveners, uh, audio conferencing. There's me. That's audio conferencing to the villages. Okay, a, a little bit different, but not a lot. S same inside. So because people were out in the villages, I decided to start making materials that would actually help them learn because they couldn't come in and very often people did not speak good English or uh, English wasn't their first language. Plus, you had people sitting out there in the villages listening to audio conferencing and they had hearing problems because most people out in the villages, there's all sorts of problems with motors and engines and, and people's hearings deteriorate after a while. Most of my students were older, uh, 30, 20, 30, 40. And so I started making things such as laser discs and I would make them and send them out. I would make computer programs, videotapes, audio tapes, all sorts of stuff, fax machines. I'd send out faxes and everything just so that people would, would have things before they came to class. What a crazy idea. Have all this stuff before you come to class. See, Read it, look at it, think about it, email me, whatever. There was no email. No, there was pigeons, maybe. And uh, we were in a village called Bethel. And in the winter, the river froze and became a state highway. People could actually drive up. It, it was that, you know, that cold and that high. So uh, I would make all sorts of stuff. And here's one example. This is called the Yuktarvik Museum program. There was a little museum of Eskimo artifacts that's about the size of maybe, maybe both of you all put together. And so I, I thought it would be a great idea to do a video disc, laser disc. You all know what, remember laser disc and stuff? So we made a laser disc of this. And we got all the things that were in there and actually made a computer program to go along with it. And we actually used it in school so that people could, could do different technology, uh, different programs about their culture. And later when the, when the museum burned down, that was the only thing that was left. And that actually, that laser disc ended up at the Smithsonian. I also work with a colleague who was, uh, he's a biology teacher, and we decided to make, this is his idea, I just helped him, to make a Yupik science laser disc, which was taking examples from Western Alaska and uh, using them to teach universal science concepts. So if oil and water, we had seal oil and water and, and all sorts of stuff. And, and the idea was that we could use technology to raise the status of Eskimo culture. Because at that time, uh, the Eskimos, the Yupik Eskimos, had been put down for years. And uh, the treatment was, I, I can't even tell you how bad it was, but that's not my story. That's their story. So uh, I spent a lot of time developing materials. And then I knew that being able to, to do these kinds of things, give people materials, technology before they come to class. When they come to class, they have a better experience. So that was my experience. Then uh, later on, I read about a thing called flip learning. I said, what is that? Must be what I'm doing, because it sounds like just what I'm doing. And flip learning was basically a classroom where outside the classroom, before students come to class, they have some stuff to do. Uh, not a lot of deep things, but just take care of the housekeeping stuff or, or learning what pages to read or, or some kind of uh, advanced notice. Lots of teachers in this flip learning one would make self-made videos. They videotape themselves giving a lecture, which is OK, but I, I would never do something like that. Then in class, students would come in. They'd work on going deeper into the information, into the subject matter. And at the end, they'd kind of go out and what happened was that, that people were actually learning. Students were actually doing better because they weren't sitting through lectures. They weren't almost like us sitting for hours. You know, they were able to be up. They had active learning. And there. there we go. OK, so that's flip learning one. And you see the difference is flip learning one, basically, teachers made the videos and they you know, they were in isolation. No one else knew what was going on in the school. Shh, flipping, flipping. Don't tell anybody. And students all had the same, they had the same assignment, but they were at least up out of the room. And John Bergman, he was one of the first guys to do this. He once told me, he said, you know, it's not the technology, it's not 
anything else, it's the relationships. He said that. It's the relationships. The teacher is free, finally, to build up relationships with kids. He can walk around. She can walk around. And they can work with kids individually, as teams, as groups. And it was magnificent. And he said, people recognize this. Flip Learning 2.0, a few years later, technology actually had advanced so much. And you all know that. Technology, I mean, we can do things today that only the nerds could do a few years ago. <laughs> Flip Learning 3.0 basically kind of broke the mold because technology did all sorts of things, uh, give us, gives us all sorts of powers that we couldn't, things we couldn't do before. So technology, uh, Flip Learning 3.0 basically takes Bloom's taxonomy and kind of turns it into a, a diamond so that most of the work that people do before class is just the, the basic stuff. And during class, they can actually go deeper into whatever it is that, that the curriculum says. The global impetus, the global flip learning global initiative came about because the internet, universities, teachers got together and they all said, hey, we're doing something that really works well. So the flip learning global initiative was born. John Bergman and other folks got together and they got university folks, business people, researchers, and they developed this flip learning uh, it's kind of an advocacy group where they, they train people and they send them around to, to show people how to do flip learning. Uh, research has been outstanding. And uh, they, they decided, they came up with this idea that flip learning is what we call a meta strategy. That means that you just don't go into the classroom and start flipping learning, but actually there's something that, that you do that flip learning allows you to do. Uh, universities are adopting it, and there's even a uh, flip learning university out of Turkey. Their paradigm, the way they do this, is phenomenal. I, I can't even describe how good it is, but if you're interested, the resource, the reference is here. And here's some flip learning leaders. These are a hundred of the most uh, active people in this year, 2018. And if you notice on the third row is uh, Stephanie, who's one of our graduate students. She's here in Connecticut and Clinton. If anybody's interested in flip learning, she's right here. And there's a flip learning global faculty also that are trained to do flip learning. And I had the privilege of actually observing a flip learning class at Harvard, Harvard Medical School. We got invited to, to see what this one professor was doing, an, an old professor named uh, Schwartzstein. And he had invited John Bergman to come in and John invited us uh, to come in with him. And so we sat down and watched how he was working this class, this traditional class of lecturing his med students. And he was walking up and down the aisles, just like Socrates in the old days. And he was talking to people, and he was, people were asking him questions, and he would turn back on them. And it was exciting. And people at the desks were picking up these little index cards and writing down things, putting them in had no idea what it was, and I didn't know any of the science. So I kind of, it was okay, it was fun. Then all of a sudden, I heard this medicine. I said, wait a second, I'm taking that medicine. And then uh, they were doing hematology, which is the blood. And then they started mentioning a couple of symptoms. And I said, wait a second, that's me. I have that symptom too. And so I was sitting there, wrapped, hoping they would come out and let me know what I have. <laughs> but at the very end, all they did was kind of leave it to the students. And at the end of the class, uh, we spoke with the professor. And I said, well, what were those index cards? And he said, you know, when you're in a group and people give each other answers, one person comes out with the answer and everybody goes, mm -hmm. He said, those people who are nodding their head don't know it. So it's part of his practice to actually do some stuff. Write down, which as an old writing project fellow, I, I'm a writing project person, uh, I believe that writing is probably the, one of the best forms of thinking and learning. Then he also, he had students get together, talk, give each other all sorts of comments and feedback. And as I was walking out, I said, wait a second. You know, I'm a third grade teacher from way back. And we used to use a thing called think, pair, share. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. But he was doing all the stuff that we had done in the old days. And so I was thinking to myself, this really is a meta strategy. 
the idea of flipping the class really allows you to do all the other things that you can do. And so for me, that was the first time I really, really got it in my bones. That's central. We train teachers to actually do flipping. And we model that so that if you have anybody in the ed program, they'll flip. Uh, there's a magazine, a journal that you can get, a flip learning review. Uh, the address is here at the end, the resources are here. If you're interested in any, any people coming to your organization or speakers, they're all here. Um, I think it's probably the most exciting thing that's happening in education these days. So thank you.